Good morning. Uh, welcome to USIPCO 2020. Uh, even if 2020 is a year we'd rather forget and we are holding this conference virtually in uh, early 2021. Nonetheless, it's a great honour for me to be invited by the USIP Adcom and by the USIPCO 2020 committee. Uh, and I thank them very much. Uh, so I'm Steve McLaughlin, I'm from uh, Watt University in uh, Edinburgh, in Scotland. And I'm going to talk to you about challenges in imaging and sensing in the photon star regime. Uh, of course, uh, we have to acknowledge the collaborators and funders. So I'd like to acknowledge the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council of the UK, uh, through the UDRC and the National Quantum Technologies Programme that funded a lot of this research, and DSDL and uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering, who also helped fund some of the work. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators, uh, this journey into this sort of computational imaging, which is primarily what I'm going to talk about today. It started 10 years ago when I visited John E. Turnery in Toulouse and he introduced me to hyperspectral imaging. He also introduced me to Johan Altman and he and I have shared this journey over the last 10 years working on a variety of interesting problems. And of course, there are other colleagues, William Tekela, Quentin Lagros, Mike Davies, Abdi Halimi, Vivek Goyal and Al Hero. And of course, we are very reliant on experimental collaborators, so Gerald Buller, Angus McCarthy, Laura Macaroni and Rachel Tugin in uh, Harry Watt University in Edinburgh and the Single Photon LiDAR, and Angela DeFulvio, formerly at University of Michigan, uh, University of Illinois, who provided some of the radionuclide data that I'll talk about later. So, imaging and sensing. So, uh, primarily, I'm interested in imaging and sensing as the collection and detection of light. And I take light not just as visible light, but across the, the whole spectrum, either remitted. Uh, uh, or reflected from a target. And I'll talk about two examples there, radionuclide where it's emitted or reflected when we're dealing with single photon LIDAR phones from a target or an object. And we're interested in, in getting either a representation of the, the object or a representation of the physical properties of the object or the target. And of course, uh, we've seen enormous uh, and rapid advances in the technology. The iPhone 12 has uh, three, four cameras, has a LiDAR sensor on it. Who would have envisaged that uh, five years ago? And here we see uh, an example of a car. I'm not sure I would like to drive it for an automotive vehicle with a, a proliferation of, of sensors placed on it. And the key here is that if we look at the pace of technology, uh, we're going to see the, these imaging and sensing technology become increasingly more and more sophisticated. They already have unprecedented levels of sensitivity and resolution that are achievable, and these are just going to get better. And what I'm particularly interested in is, is, if you like, not quite the interface between the analog and the digital world, because of course we often in the real world have to deal with things which are analog, say voltages, uh, but we may also have to deal with things which are digital or discrete as well, so heterogeneous. But I'm going to focus on here, uh, essentially we have these sensors we can describe in terms of the physics, and write down the models, the mathematics that's associated with them. And that coupled with computation in the digital domain is essentially the intersection of those three things. It gives us this, this computational imaging research field, which is something which has grown uh, significantly over the last 10 years. I've been around for a very long time, but for the last 10 years, primarily driven by technology and the capability in, in computation. And I'm going to focus uh, on uh, the intersection between these, between the mathematics, the physics, and, and the computation. So I'm going to do it within a, a Bayesian methods framework. Uh, I, I'm not a devout Bayesian, nonetheless, uh, I find it very powerful, particularly when I want to deal with the uncertainty management that exists here. I've got essentially uh, noisy and incomplete measurements. We've got prior information that we have to make some assumptions about. And then there's a determination of the quality of the output. So so put it diagrammatically here on the right, essentially what we're considering is we have data or observations, and we have prior information, we have an algorithm, and the, these all influence each other. So the, the, the data and observations may influence the, the priors. Uh, the priors clearly will have an impact on how we operate the algorithm, as will the data, and these things will all interact. Uh, I, the sort of algorithms I'm going to think about are essentially sort of map, uh, penalized maximum likelihood methods. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, NCMC or simulation-based methods. 
And I'll also talk about approximate methods, which are becoming uh, very, very popular because they are extremely powerful, essentially using approximate inference methods and message passing methods to, to deal with our problems. Now, of course, where we start off with, we start off with a model. Now, we know, uh, according to George Fox, that all models are wrong, but of course, some are more useful than others. So uh, here's a very sort of general forward model. If we ignore the, the, the G function here, then we have a simple linear model, Y equals AX plus N, something that, that we learn in signal processing 101. But equally, we could have a nonlinear forward model, hence the presence of the, the G A of X. And the noise may not be Gaussian, could be not an IV, we could have multiplicative noise. And we've got to deal with the issue of outliers or, or events which are uh, uh, not within the sort of average behavior we would expect to see. So how do we, how do we generate robustness to cope with those? So I'm going to try and construct how we think about the algorithm within that sort of framework. I'm not going to address uh, machine learning, which often doesn't assume a model, it works purely from a data-driven method. There are some interesting interactions and intersections, but that's really for another day, and it's not my particular area uh, to talk about. So let's talk about the, the sort of applications that we're I'm particularly interested in. So let, let's deal with single photon LIDAR. So here we have a, a laser system or a LIDAR system, uh, essentially a laser ranging system. Uh, but uh, with the advances in SPADS or single photon avalanche detector technology, we are able to detect with exquisite high resolution for, for depth and for 3D imaging. So we're going to image through some medium, in this case, could be clouds, could be smoke. You'll have other objects around the object you're particularly interested in, in this case, trees, and we have a car. So we fire a laser. Uh, and normally we'll collect uh, on the, a pixel. Normally we're moving towards arrays of these devices now. We'll pick up a pulse. Uh, or a detection. So essentially, we, we construct the histogram. So the time of flight, of course, gives us the distance. Uh, these lasers are often operating at hundreds of kilohertz uh, repetition rates. So we get a second return. But equally, of course, uh, narrow field of view, particularly if we go longer longer distance, we may detect no uh, pulses because of the presence of, of the sun and, and other light sources. We may detect more, or we may receive more than one. but in this particular case, I'm going to only record one. And here we have a, a fifth and all at slightly different locations. So essentially we can construct a histogram. And from that histogram, we can use information about the time of depth. And we can also look at the reflectivity uh, of the, the energy of the pulse that returns, which is going to be dependent on the reflectivity of the object or the target that you have actually impacted on. We could expand this if we wished into multiple wavelengths. So, for example, what to do color imaging, so here red, green, and blue. But in principle, it could be across a range. You can use a super continuum laser uh, for this, which would have all the wavelengths you require, which is detectors in different wavelength, wave bands. Uh, or you could fire the, 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 the laser sequentially at different wavelengths if you so wish. There are a variety of approaches you could take in this case, but firing the different wavelengths uh, sequentially to deal with that. So what does the observation model actually look like? Well, so if, if we look first of all at the, the, the diagram at the top, so, so the red is the kind of idealized, so you get some peaks of this one, one photon coming back and it's, the object's not moving, we've got a fixed uh, receiver. So roughly this is saying here that the peak is where we would locate our pulse. But of course, uh, we receive other pulses, we receive some noise. Uh, so it's more likely to look like the blue. Uh, and, and the way that we write this down mathematically, so we've got some photon count, which essentially is Y here, indexed by N and T, where N represents the pixels because we're dealing with an array, and T represents the particular time bid that we're dealing with. Uh, we have a reflectivity associated with the photon that arrives at a particular pixel, so R subscript N, and then this G dot T minus T N represents the instrument response uh, associated at a particular pixel. So if you like, not just the laser, you have the medium, the transmission, etc. And of course, we'll have some background again indexed on the, the, the pixel. You'll have set a maximum histogram length, which you divide into the number of bins. Uh, and essentially, this gives our description. And of course, it, it's a pass on process, pass on arrival process that we have to deal with. So what are the detection challenges that we actually have here? So here's a, here's a kind of 
a very simplistic description. Again, we're trying to uh, light on the car or may or may not be a target. So uh, essentially we may get very few detected photons. So here we see in red, the kind of idealized, where we get this cluster. So that's saying this is the kind of the main. You might get extremely high background because uh, uh, many places, unlike Scotland, are, are really quite sunny. So here we can see that high background means that I might struggle to detect. Maybe no target or, or no returns for you to detect the target present. But how do you discern that? Do you discern that perhaps this peak here? Is, is that a, a peak? Uh, and of course, we have multiple peaks. And of course, in the signal process community, we would recognize uh, many of these type of problems in many, many other applications. So in some respects, whilst it's a, a kind of modern example, it has lots of connections to what we've seen before. So let's look at how it actually behaves. So this picture here is of a school. Not all schools are like this in Edinburgh. Uh, this is Daniel Stewart Mills College. And if we focus in on this tower, this turret here, uh, we can see that we have a laser beam fired at a distance of about 1.8 kilometers. Uh, it's fired oblique to the, uh, the roof here. You'll notice here also that we have <coughs> essentially uh, gaps, small sort of windows, there is no glass through here. So there's an interesting question what will happen. One of the, the key things here is that uh, we've taken 800 temple bins, with roughly 900 photons per pixel with a an array which is 120 by 96 pixel, and we have a signal to background ratio of 1.64. So the key here is actually because of the distance, because of the oblique nature, we'll actually get a stretching of the instrument response, essentially the pulse width of the laser would stretch out. And that's not really why I kind of want to highlight that. I want to, so this is based, this is an algorithm, an MCMC method, a simulation based method, uh, looking at either intensity or, or adapting for the fact that we can adapt for the peak width given the oblique. And we can see here, and this is based on a, an algorithm called Manipop that, that Julian developed in his PhD, published in uh, Journal of Imaging Science, as I am. Uh, we can see in through the detail, we can see the sort of small windows here. But the thing that's more important here, rather than through the details of how we constructed the, 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 the MCMC approach is, the execution time on the standard workstation is the order 195 seconds. It is very far from the real time. So the question for us is, okay, how do we actually move towards some sort of real time reconstruction, real time analysis? This is a complex and difficult inference problem. We have data volume and array size challenges. We have acquisition frame rates if we want to operate in real time. And, you know, there's been a an enormous literature over the last 25, 30 years in the optimization domain in signal processing, which has helped accelerate a lot of programs toward a lot of algorithms toward real time. But we should always understand that optimization does not necessarily mean faster. We have issues around the dimensionality of the data and the number of unknowns, convergence speed, uh, convergence. Uh, so actually what we have to start, we have to start rethinking the inference process that we're dealing with if we want to move towards the real time. And that's really what I want to talk about. And it's not just an implementation issue. You're not simply saying, okay, let's put it on a GPU or parallelize it. We will think about parallel structures, but we also got to think about the statistical models that underlie the, the development of our algorithm or our inference process. And we have to think about how we would denoise and how do we make these operate in a scalable way. And, and the kind of core approach we're going to do is essentially plug and play approaches. Uh, coupled with some point cloud denoisers drawn from the computer graphics community. And we're all aware of, of how powerful, uh, how many advances that have happened in the computer graphics. You can look at the advance of Pixar, the quality of the animations that we see. And they're not just driven by the fact that they've got very powerful computers. There are some very, very clever algorithms in there as well. So let, let's start from, from the back, if you like, start with, with the example. So here we've got a relatively straightforward problem in the sense that we're within a lab, we don't have to worry about background noise, we're relatively close range, the order of a few meters, and we're simply trying to reconstruct a, a mannequin head uh, by firing our LIDAR system at it. And we've got kind of four examples, four algorithms here. So here we've got Manipop, which is the essentially the method that I, I showed when we, we showed the, the Daniel Sherman Memorial College tower. Uh, execution time, the order of 200 in one second for a single frame. 
We could go cross correlation, which was what essentially the, the physics community had been using in developing the LIDAR system. So, so but it's not terribly robust if we have uh, lots of background noise. If we start, then we'll see that later on. Uh, we could go for, you know, Vivek Goyal and John Trapp, the opt method, uh, using essentially a kind of maximum likelihood of intensity thresholding. But again, it's uh, it's it's the order of 200 seconds. And the method I'm going to talk about or to show you how we develop the algorithm essentially allows us to do this 30 milliseconds per frame. And if you look carefully, you'll see it's also got a uh, probably the best quality similar certainly in terms of the intensity uh, better than all the other methods and very similar to rap and dial probably slightly better but certainly one of the fastest so how do we go about designing the algorithm as well so i said we picked this in the Bayesian framework so essentially if we look we've got a posterior uh, up here which is proportional to the product of the likelihood of a prior uh, so in math estimation, essentially what we're trying to do is we're going to try and minimize this, this uh, data fidelity term here, the, the negative log likelihood, and we've got a regularizer uh, present as well. The problem is both be, can be kind of challenging because they're, they can both be non-smooth and multimodal. So uh, what we're going to see is that, that we can uh, Think about, so I think I just jumped my slide. Yes, so uh, we can think about actually how we're going to deal with this by looking at the problem and saying, okay, let's let's do what all good engineers do and break down the problem into smaller, easier problems. So in this case, I'm going to uh, split the, the, the problem and I'm going to try and minimize H, Y, X, minimize my fidelity or my negative log likelihood term uh, with respect to X and U. Plus, I've got a regularization term split into dealing with this, this parameter u is such that x equals u. Uh, and these smaller problems can often be seen as denoising problems. So, and, and, and we can use some dedicated denoisers. And, and uh, I'll say a little bit about the method, but the full details are, are here in this paper published in Nature Commons that, that Julian did during his PhDs. So, the key here is that we can use plug and play approaches. Bear in mind that we've got no analytical expression for the regularizer here. So, so, uh, how do we go about designing the algorithm? Well, well, we're going to make we're going to exploit this this method by Gunnabod and Gross algebraic points at Circe developed some time ago uh, in the graphics community, and we're going to use that as a way of doing our, our point cloud denoising. Uh, I, I know that the plug and play is increasingly used for image restoration, but here our X includes a 3D point cloud. And it's a 3D point cloud. That really means we've got 2D surfaces within 3D volume. So if we go for voxel-based methods, it's computational. It's going to be way, way, way too intensive. Uh, and remember, we're trying to drive towards a sort of real-time approach here. So essentially, what we're going to do is exploit this this APSS uh, denoiser. Uh, it's going to give us a more structured prior. It's going to allow us to deal with uh, uh, gives a more scalable uh, solution, which is ultimately where we're aiming towards. So. How is the algorithm actually going to form? Where essentially, uh, basically, we've got sort of three components that we've got to do with the three elements. We have to, we've got to deal with the depth, if you like, the time of flight. We have to deal with the reflectivity or the intensity of the pulse that returns. And we've got to deal with the fact that we've got a background that's actually associated here. So I basically split uh, each of these into a, a depth update, a reflectivity update, and a background update, each informing the other. Are each informing the next step. And uh, I will essentially, within each of these, break this into a gradient step and a, a, a point cloud or a, a denoising step. So essentially, what it does is it allows us to iterate between depth, intensity, and background updates. Essentially, there, as I said, we're applying this gradient step followed by a denoiser. And each step can be processed very quickly in parallel. So we're actually driving down towards a low execution time. And essentially, it's following the general structure of PAM. So if you like, it's computing proximal gradient steps on the blocks of variables. T, if you like, your, your depth update, because time of flight. R, the reflectivity or intensity, and B, the background. And basically, each update first adjusts the current estimates for the gradient step. That's taken respect to the log likelihood, or so the fidelity term, associated with the intensity of the reflected, sorry, with the depth, with the intensity, and with the background, followed by an off-the-shelf denoising step. 
And that off the shelf you know, is noise is essentially playing the role of the proximal operator. And while the, the gradient step takes into account the single photon laser observation model with some plus on statistic, presence of dead pixels, et cetera, the denoising step profits from off the shelf point cloud denoisers, the APSSS that I, I, I talked about earlier. So, so let's look at the, the, the depth update. So essentially, we take a, a gradient step state with the depth variable t you know, and, and the point cloud phi, and it's denoised with the algebraic point set surfaces algorithm, the APSSS algorithm, which works in a real world coordinate system. And essentially, what APSS is doing, it's fitting a smooth continuous surface to the set of points that are defined by your time t that you're dealing with, using spheres as essentially local parameters. In the intensity update, we take the gradient steps, take with respect to reflectivity, followed by a, a denoising step, which is using the, the, the manifold metrics uh, defined in the real world coordinates. And in that way, we're only considering correlation between points within the same surface. You know, and that's important when we think of the nature of an object that exists within a, a, an image. Then the background, it's a similar fashion to the intensity and depth. We take a gradient step with respect to the background. And then the proximal operator is going to depend on the particular characteristics of the LIDAR system that you're using. And essentially, it, what you have here, we're using a sort of image based plug and play strategy for reflectivity and background. Uh, and it, it, the point cloud denoising is essentially off the shelf point cloud denoising, it's essentially local sphere fitting. Uh, and you saw with, with the, the, the the, the mannequin, as we see here, we can do a 3D reconstruction. We can think about doing a frame. So how does it actually be when we think about real time? So let's look at, here we've got a situation where we've got a video operating 50 frames a second. Uh, or, uh, we're using a Princeton Lightweight Kids Kessel camera, which is 32 by 32 pixels. It has multiple, we can deal with multiple surfaces per pixel. We have a bi-static system, so our transmitter or laser is, is not aligned directly with the receiver and we're at a distance of the order of 300, 320 meters uh, on the Heliot Walk It's not a terribly bright day, uh, quite a cold day in, in, in autumn, as you can see. But the interesting thing here is if we look at the video on the right-hand side, you can quite clearly see Angus and uh, Julian walking back and forth between the surfaces. And we can see each of the different surfaces. We can deal with this through time and we can process this in the order of 50 frames a second. So suddenly we've been able to demonstrate that for the first time we could use single photon LIDAR and you can see the number of points per pixel we're dealing with is, is relatively small and we can construct things at distance and do real time video. But of course, that's not the whole story. Uh, there's an interesting question that says, how do we deal with, with robustness? So let's go back and look at the, the algorithm. So you know, this is just reflecting again the way that we split the model. We've got minimize our, our uh, data fidelity term and our reg we've got a regularizer. And we know that plug and play is generally used for, for better priors or denoising, but we can also use it for the data fidelity term. You know, Now, there are often challenges of computational complexity, uh, but there is a certain sort of temptation of how we would deal with robustness to model mismatch, how do we deal with the outliers? And so really what we're saying is, how do we go about designing the, the, the data fidelity term here? while maintaining this sort of Bayesian interpretation. Now, uh, we know that if we looked at sort of maximum likelihood, essentially what you're doing is you're minimizing the, the, the cobic liber, the TL divergence between the empirical data distribution and some parametric form of the, of, of the distribution. So between uh, F hat Y and F X and Y. Uh, and and uh, we, we talk about this in some detail in a paper from a conference paper that, Quentin did in his PhD. And the insight here is to realize that we could, if we chose a, a change the divergence, didn't use just Kulbeck Liber, we could potentially select a robust estimator. Uh, and essentially, what we do is we, we could construct, uh, we could select a, a, a solve a penalized KL divergence minimization problem. The penalization comes from the fact that really what we're trying to do is we're trying to match the, the likelihood term. Uh, to be close to the prior, okay? So essentially, that's really where we're going to go. And of course, if we do that, that's really taking us to a pseudo, pseudo Bayesian estimation. And essentially what we're doing is we're going to change the similarity measure so we can obtain some pseudo likelihood. So F tilde, Y condition in X. Uh, and we're trying to drive this with this penalization uh, to get as close as we can towards uh, 
the the prior. So this is a, a if you like a pseudo posterior distribution that, that we've got here. Pseudo posterior because it relies on the pseudo likelihood. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to pick a beta divergence. Well, we're going to pick a simple model. I'm going to omit the background in the previous. We could deal with multiple surfaces. We're going to assume we only need to worry about the one, but you'll see uh, how that comes out when I show you in a moment. Uh, and we're going to use a beta divergence, which is going to be much more robust to high background levels. Because if you remember in the first video, we didn't have particularly high background levels, and whilst it worked very well, you could see that we're almost likely to fail. And we'll see that. I'll show you an example of that in the video in a moment. Uh, the advantage of the beta divergence is if we allow beta to go to zero, essentially we just get asymptotically back to the, the KL divergence. The interesting question comes, how do we get scalability if we've got dynamic scenes? So essentially where we've got a, a, from frame to frame, significant change, so fast moving objects, because what we're starting to see with these, these array SPAD detectors is that they can have extremely high frame rates. They order 150 kilohertz. Well, we're going to adopt a, a sort of variational inference approach. So this, this uh, pseudo uh, uh, likelihood is generally non-standard. Uh, so we'll approximate it. And what we're going to do, we're going to approximate it by Gaussian distribution. So essentially, we're going to say that, that this is reasonably close, uh, not necessarily good from a statistic point of view. But you'll see from an algorithm point of view, actually, it works pretty well. And if we do that, this just produces the moment matching. And essentially, the density filter is just the expectation propagation. And we only have to propagate, propagate the means and the variances over time. And we, we can look at pixels close to each other to, to allow us to deal with uh, across. And so essentially, uh, there was some work. Uh, it's published in, in transient processing with Johan and Mike and myself, where essentially we could say, well, let's look at a, a Gaussian mixture based model which allows us to get to a, a sort of birth death process because that allows us to have new surfaces appearing in the scene and uh, surfaces disappearing from the scene. So that would allow us to give essentially a, a pseudo posterior interference, an inference mod problem that essentially it, it is set up within, a, if you like, a, a, an approximation because uh, we're approximated to Gaussian mixture models and Gaussians. So what does it look like? So. Here I'm going to show you again, this is, is Angus and, and uh, Julian are going to throw a ball between each other. Uh, this is using the Price light wave camera, high static transceiver system again, you're still on the order of 300 meters. Uh, and uh, we are going to throw a ball between them. And you'll see, if you look above, you can see here that they're passing the ball. We can actually reconstruct this. We can just let me just play it again for you. We can see, see this going real time. So. This, this demonstrates that we're actually per, you know, we can actually do the real time we can do between scenes. But remember, I talked about what happens when we want to look at uh, looking at multiple frames. So let's look at the method. So this is comparing essentially with the, the this is the method here on the right, is essentially the method that Julian developed for the, the real time. This is essentially a, a method, uh, which essentially is, is a maximum likelihood estimate using an intensity threshold. And here we have the method I've just talked about using the, the beta divergences and it's gonna appear in transactions and its processing. And it's the same video where we're showing the, the, the Julian and, and uh, uh, I just throwing the ball between each other. And what you can see here is you can see that because of the background, uh, this is much less robust. You know, whilst you can just about make out that the ball is passing, let me play that again. Uh, you would think, oh, I could just about see these. It's actually quite difficult to see where it's quite clearly here with the beta divergence because it's much more robust to, to the background. Uh, and clearly as this, the signal to background ratio changes, that would have a, a particular impact on uh, how you would actually operate. So one last thing that comes out of the development of that method uh, of doing it in that way is of course, uh, we're interested in understanding the the uh, the uncertainty. I talked about the uncertainty measure. We'd also like to understand what's the uncertainty in our estimate. And whilst Julian appears to be doing a sort of Monty Python esque uh, Ministry of Silly Walks here, running back and forth, what we're really interested in is okay, how accurately can we quantify uh, the uncertainty we have in the estimate of his position? So if I uh, 
just shown here. So what we have, this is looking at the pixel 1616. So it looks like right at one pixel. And it's essentially on the vertical axis, it's the distance you see it goes between right, uh, just under 322 meters to about 324 meters. The red represents the, the posterior mean that we get as a byproduct of the algorithm. And you can see that the, the uh, this is the, the blue curve represents the plus or minus six sigma. And you can see that when we start, our uncertainty is relatively large, but tightens up as we, we come around. Uh, so we can actually track the position of the surface and we can have depth uncertainty measures to quantify uncertainties associated, for example, if we are instantaneous velocity or moving objects. So, you know, the whole point of that sort of proximate inference process, that sort of Bayesian formalism, it gives us access to these procedures and therefore having access to those actually becomes quite important in understanding uh, how good our estimates are. And that's one of the, the, the key questions in, in uh, many of the applications here for low elimination. And in fact, it is the key point in, in the next application, which I wish to move towards. So it may seem like a kind of slightly strange that I'm talking about sort of low photon or single photon LIDAR imaging systems. Uh, but essentially, the, for radionuclide detection, the, the, there's a growing threat or a special nuclear material. So uh, basically, uh, highly rich uranium, weapons grade plutonium, uh, or high activity radiological sources that, that particular people might wish to smuggle uh, uh, and actually use. And one of the key things that states do is they install uh, radiation portal monitors. We won't go into the technology that underlies those, quite different from the SPADs. Uh, so here's one for taking, say, a truck. Uh, here's one, for example, an airport where you're walking through, uh, where you're looking to detect these. But one of the challenges is you think of the sheer number of uh, container units that are shipped around the globe. Uh, and if the process, you want to do a quick check with one of these portal monitors, that if it flags up, would involve a more detailed search to see if there's actually something in there. Uh, but you're dealing with such a huge volume, you really need this to be quick. And you don't want to have the, 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 the Peter and the Wolf syndrome where you have too many false alarms. And we've got significant challenges here because uh, we're trying to find a needle in a haystack. We've got background because there'll be other radioactive sources. Someone who's, say, for example, had radiotherapy treatment and still be quite radioactive a few days afterwards. Uh, and you have uh, shielding. Clearly, you've got metal shielding here, could be in the bag. And so, so an interesting challenge where we're trying to detect something which is essentially uh, following the same sort of Bayesian model, in this case, it's linear. It's Poisson sources. Uh, if we look here, these, these are two examples of the sort of spectra. So connected to, if you think of the hyperspectral imaging as well, and the spectral libraries. So this is the, the, the blue curves is iridium here, uh, and the black curve here is technetium, and, and the spectral response in terms of the energy and the number of counts that you would actually receive. And similarly here, we have three examples of spectrum of thousand counts. So essentially barium, cesium, gallium, uh, and uh, there's weapons grade plutonium in there in the gallium and the, the, the barium. Uh, so the essentially these are three mixtures, mixture two, mixture three, mixture five, so the mixture of basic barium, cesium, gallium, a mixture here of gallium, technetium, and weapons grade plutonium and a mixture of uh, barium, iridium, and weapons grade plutonium. And you see, A, the spectra are quite similar. Uh, you see that it's uh, the number of counts is relatively small. Uh, so we have a significant challenge here. And, and there are some other challenges as well. The, the, the noise is, is multiplicative. Uh, we got positivity of X. X is relatively sparse. So we've got an interesting challenge of how we do this. So, so there are similarities in how we would have similarities in that we're dealing with uh, compared to the, the, the low photon LIDAR. Different type of problem, different type of connector. And we're going to adopt the kind of approximate inference approach again. So based around essentially there's a paper in the machine learning uh, uh, literature with uh, Hernandez, Lobato, and Suarez, uh, essentially using a spike and slab prior essentially Bernoulli truncated Gaussian distributions, and we're going to have a multimodal posterior. Uh, if you try and do it with MCMC or simulation-based methods, you end up with non-standard conditional distributions, and, and the marginalization 
for example, using a partially collapsed skid sampler is just not possible, unlike in the Gaussian case. So essentially, we're going to look at using a variational inference approach using expectation propagation. I'm not going to get into the details, it's just really not enough time. But I want to look at here, here, here we've got uh, the plots, the root mean square error plots we're looking at nine mixtures. So these are uh, mixtures in this case, mixture one is in American Medicunum and cesium. We've got the barium, cesium, gallium. We've got the gallium, technetium, and weapons grade plutonium, and so on. Uh, and we've compared the sort of variational inference, approximate inference approach against a, a minimum mean squared error uh, L1 norm based method uh, and uh, an MAP uh, L1 based norm method, both of which require considerable tuning. They need an awful lot of tuning. And the reason that the, the mean squared error is down is the horizontal axis here is the number of counts and the root mean square. So think of the problem. The problem is you've got these sources masked within, say, a large container, perhaps with other sources in there, but also some shielding. So the number of counts could be relatively small. So you can see that for all the methods, uh, and they're all kind of similar, uh, the number of counts going from roughly a thousand up to a million. So if you had somewhere like a million counts, it would work pretty well. But you would like to operate with as minimal number of counts as possible. Uh, the advantage of, of the, the variational inference approach, the, the sort of uh, the same MSE BTG sort of method I've talked about, is that we get directly uncertainty qualification. I'll show that in a minute. So we feel like when I showed right at the end with Julian running back and forth, we can look at the posterior and we can get some estimate of how good our estimate is. And that's going to be important when we don't know how many counts we're actually going to get a priori. Uh, so it, it, it's really quite important. So this, this is a plot looking at the approximate marginal probabilities. Again, what we have is in the, the x-axis, we've got plots of the number of counts, and we have the different mixtures, if you like, or, or sorry, the different mixtures going around, the nine mixtures here, and we've got the different uh, components that potentially could exist within those mixtures. What's interesting in all the cases, when you have a relatively low number of, so, so let's pick the, the, the middle row here, if you have a relatively low number of counts, then uh, you see isotopes that are not actually present in the actual mixture being identified as potentially present, and that's your sort of false alarm. And the more counts you have, uh, then the more likely you are to get an accurate estimate. And so you can see that the uncertainty quantification becomes uh, critically important in actually determining if your algorithm is working correctly. So let me start to sort of finish off. Uh, it's been a bit of a rush through. Uh, I've decided not to go into details of the algorithms. It's a plenary after all. You've not really sort of want me to go through the mitigated details and more than capable of reading the papers. But some observations. The thing that tied the two applications together, low elimination regimes, essentially, in terms of the number of detections would be relatively small, large uncertainties in non-Gaussian. Uh, I have found, or we have found, that variational methods are much better. If we, we give us, uh, you know, for faster inference, we get tractable approximations. We can use plug and play for scalability. We can get access to uh, posteriors to give us some uh, measure of quantification of the uncertainty. We can that allows us to trade off accuracy and robustness. For example, in terms of model mismatch, remember all models are wrong. Some interesting questions around what guarantees we have around the plug and play approaches. Do we have any and what would be interesting to explore? So to conclude, what I would really argue is that we to exploit the technological advances that are here and, and, and continue to advance, we really got to go beyond that sort of traditional decoupled image and sensing pipeline that thinks about separate consideration of the device physics, the signal process, and the end user. You really have to think about the inference problem combined and really think it as an integrated sensing and inference model. Now, I'm not the first to say that. Interesting challenge here, of course, is that we see a lot of work in the machine learning, the neural networks community. Treat it all as a black box. Don't worry about how they interact. The interesting challenge in the, in the, the applications I give is that uh, very little ground truth data, uh, very little data, uh, think of the radionuclei problem. How would they behave? How would they operate? So an interesting comparison. I have some interesting work in the astronomical imaging community, which looks at interactions between these sort of approaches. How would we adapt to non-standard acquisition systems, for example, event-based cameras? 
So how are we going to combine data-driven and physical model-based approaches? What do we do with, with little or no ground tracer? What are the limits that we can start to push from, from an inference point of view? And one last thing I would like to say, I am the uh, co-technical program chair with, with uh, Sabrina Greco and uh, Yasin Zerubia for USIPCO 2021 in Ireland, in Dublin. So I would, one hopes, since we now have vaccines available, that uh, we will all be able to meet up and enjoy ourselves. So I would warmly welcome you to submit your papers and come along to USIPCO in Dublin. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm more than happy to take any questions that you have now.